everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Mia Spano Curtis is a woman who takes charge. At just 39 years old, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. The ensuing 14 years after treatment have been filled with repeat surgeries, pain, and a greatly changed life. And part of the change in Mia's life evolves around her advocacy efforts to educate and encourage others along a not-so-easy life path post-cancer. Mia, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, give us a little bit of background on your story. Well, I was um, diagnosed at 39 years old. I had a two-year-old baby. I felt a lump in my breast and I went to the doctor and was somewhat dis, he was dismissive saying it's nothing, go get it checked, but it's nothing, it's nothing. And it was something. And, um, my life has never really been the same since it's been a big bump in the road, Pat, (laughs) no pun intended. So, so how long did you go through treatment and what happened afterwards? I went through treatment for about six months. Uh, I had a double mastectomy, botched reconstruction. They took out too much skin. So the, one side, the particular implant would fall to the side all of the time. Um, been through three, maybe four sets of implants. I, I, I don't even remember at this point um, until I met um, my saving grace plastic surgeon now. Uh, Dr. Mosharafa, maybe we'll talk about him later in the podcast. And um, I, I think I've been through at least 20 reconstructive surgeries, which is one of the reasons why um, our advocacy, BS Breast Cancer, has a map of um, patient recommended surgeons. That means that there isn't one surgeon in the United States that can pay to be on our map. You have to be recommended by your patients. And I think that's really important to note that not only for breast reconstruction, but also for flat closure, because that is so big now. Um, Women aren't just wanting to get reconstructed. They're wanting to get deconstructed or not get, you know, just be flat from the beginning. And they deserve to have nice, flat, favorable results. Um. And I like where this conversation is going, by the way, Pat, because um, too many people are not getting the results they deserve. And why this map is so important is that someone can recommend their surgeon or they can they can write us and fill out the form and say, hey, this surgeon was not great. Look at our results. What are we going to do? We're just not going to post the surgeon on our map. That's all. I think that's really important that we as um, the patients have a voice and a say in who is doing our surgery out there. I think it's incredibly important. And I think actually the information that flows patient to patient is enormously important. One of the things that people don't realize is that if your surgeon is not trained in a particular technique, he will not offer it to you. Correct. And uh, my particular surgeon, the first time I had the breast reconstruction done, um, he pretty much did it as a pastime and it showed. And if, if I ever get up the guts to show what I originally looked like, um, it was monstrous that he even did this to me. Um, my vow at that point, when I walked into that hospital and showed the vice president of the hospital, what I looked like was not to ever accept any money from anyone, but to let them know that this was never, ever going to happen on my watch again to another woman. You know, at the very least, we want to look good in our clothing. That is not too much to ask. No, I, I agree. And this really sent you on a path of advocacy, didn't you? Didn't it? Yes, ma'am. Till the day I die. Mm-hmm. I'm so angry that um, at any time the surgeon could have asked for help or say, um, this isn't going the right way. There's other teams of doctors. On my watch, this will never happen again. Uh, I'm, it hurt me on a personal level. It hurt me in my personal life. It hurts me to this day. 
In addition to the map that you have on your site of patient-recommended surgeons, what other questions should people be asking their surgeon? Well, they should ask what type of reconstruction um, is available. Because just a couple of weeks ago, we had someone ask us, oh, breast mound reconstruction, that's available. And I thought Sandra was going to jump out of her skins right away. She was on the computer writing the girl, yes, this type of breast reconstruction is available. Well, this, this patient was never given that option. Why was this patient never given that option? Why aren't all options put on the table from the first time you meet with your breast surgeon, including flat? And why would you bring flat on the table? Because there's options now. I mean, there's, there's um, problems now with the breast implants. So all of your options need to be put on the table. You need to make an educated, informed decision. I think a lot of education comes from other patients. Where do people find other people to talk to? Definitely online. Um, that really wasn't available so much when I was diagnosed years ago. I think, um, and and I think you don't talk necessarily to um, your inner circles. I just found my best information from people that were not close to me. People that had walked the walk before you, nurses at your local hospitals, um, those would be my two suggestions. So when you get through all this chemo, you get through the surgery, hopefully you heal somewhat reasonably, which may or may not be a very realistic expectation. Now what? What do you do after all of this? Well, I don't know. There's a lot of... Uh... There's a lot of damage to be undone in your mind and your brain that they don't talk about. You have to take care of that and your soul. You have to get back of some semblance of normalcy in your life. But your life never goes back to what it was. And I think that in and of itself is takes a lot of work. And you have to give yourself a break. Almost like you took all that chemo. Now you have to take in all of this to allow your soul and your body and your mind to reawake to this new normal. What were some of the things that you did? I definitely walked a lot. Um, Not so much running. I used to be a runner, but a lot less running, more walking, swimming. Your body might be achy after the chemo. Some of it never goes away. Um, So you have to maybe shift what you used to do pre-cancer to after cancer, be sensitive to that, be easy on yourself, allow your time, yourself time to read some books, maybe shorter passages in the books, because I don't know, I just found it a little bit more difficult to concentrate on a longer book. Um, I love, and Sandra loves, um, Chameleon Aura. That's a great, great book. I, I don't have the author offhand. I'm sorry, not, not to give credit. Um, Keep your friend circle a little bit smaller, a little less toxic. You can say no to that holiday party. You can go and stay for less time, or you can have your own holiday party with the own people, you know, the people that you like. The rules have completely changed now, and you don't owe anyone an explanation about it. Did did your cancer experience impact your social networks? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Family included. Yes. People stepped up, people stepped down. It was a real wake up call for me on a personal level. I think a lot of us have experienced that. And it's something that, no, again, nobody talks about any of this. No one talks about or prepares you for anything other than your chemo. That's your medical, you know, MO. That's what you're going to go through. And here you go. You're done out the door. Ring the bell. Goodbye go back to your life. But that that's an untruth that I hope that BSBC um, prepares you for when you maybe come to our site or read our blogs or come to Twitter and hear what we say. And, and maybe when you meet some other um, cancer groups, it, it's not true. And there are some groups out there that tell the truth, that get down, get dirty and get real. I'm not saying you can't have a good life after chemo and cancer. You can 
but your quality of life definitely changes and you have to make those adjustments or you're going to be really disappointed and maybe not enjoy life as much as you should after what you've been through. And it's very hard to change those expectations. You've spent your whole life building a life and then it's ripped away. It is ripped away. Forever some things are ripped away. That's for sure. Um, I think I've learned to live without a lot of things and I, I don't expect a lot of things anymore, but I'm learning to create new things by myself, with my dog, with my family, um, and the people that didn't join me on this journey, that's okay. Now, I, I also lost a, a lot of things going through cancer with the, po- with the after effects. Uh, one of them was um, a lot of my physical abilities to play sports, which was the center of my life. That's how I made friends. That's how, what I did. All that was gone. And for me, I was lucky in that I stumbled into photography, which has been just a godsend. Did you find anything in particular that really helped you through that hump? Well, I did. And my daughter said to me, she goes, well, you better find something else. (laughs) And I have found a few things. And one of them for me is um, BS Breast Cancer. Um, What is the website? BSBreastCancer.com. Or you can find us every day on Twitter. I'm on Twitter every day. I run the social media. Sandra runs behind the scenes, works on the website, the map. And uh, we have many other things. We also have Rate Your Surgeon on there. We can talk about that later. But um, for me, that has channeled a lot of pet positive energy into the universe. And it's helped other people. And we are, by the way, all inclusive from day one. Um, I love everything about our community. There are no barriers, no boundaries. We have um, a, a large LGBTQIA community. My son is gay. Sandra has children in the LGBTQIA community. And, um, you know, we just, um, I just love our group. If you're a hater, you can't be part of our breast cancer group. And that's just it. That's my message. I love what we're putting out there. Now, how many years out are you from your last surgery or, or from chemo? Let me say from chemo. From chemo, let's see, probably 14 years from chemo, I had breast reconstructive surgery again this year for some nips and tucks a couple, two months ago. Um, But for me personally, I see a pain doctor on the regular. My body is not the same since chemo. I have neuropathy, constant pain and nerve pain. I'm on a lot of drugs because of it. Um. Nerve, nerve drugs. And um, it definitely affects my everyday life. And I'm not, I'm not a runner like I used to be. I can't lift weights like I used to. Same thing as you. I've made a lot of adjustments. My workouts are in the pool now. And um, I, I hate that. I lost that. I hate that for you. I hate that for me. But I'm finding other things. You know, it is what it is. You have to own it. You, you do. And um, it is a, a bump in the road that none of us anticipate. And it is life changing. If you could look back over those 14 years and you kind of look at your concerns, maybe for the, for the first few years, and then in kind of maybe the middle few years, years five to seven or so, what were you focused on? What changed for you? At seven years on, I think I was focused on you know, seeing things like my daughter get married, which she just did, you know, last week, um, and seeing Frankie get into high school, my youngest, and he is. Now my focus is changing on to myself and how I can blossom more and bring more kindness into the universe, um, not just for me, but our community, and to let people know that there's life after this. And, we're, you know, we all have a purpose here. There's... Um, got to be, I want to say that there's got to be a lot more focus on stage four for our stage four community. It's not there yet. Um, There's just a lot of work that we're doing at BSBC that I'm liking right now. And I have a lot more time to focus on it than I did seven years ago. You know, it's so interesting. As I talk to people who've been through cancer, 
I think some of the common traits that come out of it are an increase in empathy, a much greater awareness of kindness, and also an awareness of beauty. I agree. I agree. There's no longer, there's just nothing superficial after you have to cut off your body parts, go through chemo and or radiation. There's no time for that because there is no time to waste. Um, no, you, you absolutely nailed it. There's not, you get rid of all the superficial things and that alone is a game changer. And what, look at the beauty that you see now, beauty in a flower, beauty in a bird, Beauty in a person that you, you, a person you would have never looked at before is oh so beautiful just by a gesture they might make or the way they move their eyes or their hand, right? Or, or just who they are, you know, the joy that they bring to other people around them or the kindness they bring to other people around them. I, I've often thought of cancer as potentially a portal into a richer and more meaningful life. Do you think that that can be true? I do. <clears throat> I think one of the tweets that I put out today was, I hope that the one thing people in this pandemic learn is something that cancer people and pain people and chronic illness people have already known that time is precious and you can't waste it and rid your life of toxic people because there's just not enough time for those two things. You know, there's just not. You need to be living life and living it fully and Forget those trips to the mall. I mean, your time can be better served, really. You know. I agree. Toxic people, toxic environments, toxic food. We're surrounded. Um, one of the premises I have is I, I, believe, I call it our matrix, the things that make up our daily life, the people we hang with, our thoughts, what we eat, what we do, how we connect, all those sorts of relatively intangible things. And I think our matrix in this Western world and in the U.S. has gone seriously askew. We, we're <laughs> go ahead. No, I, I and um, I one of the, one of my missions is certainly to have pe is to um, motivate people to start looking at those factors in their lives and making conscious choices because you do have an option to make a healthier, kinder choice. You do, but why does it take cancer or a chronic illness or cancer and then the chronic illness that sets in to do that? Why Why do I have to come in and tell everyone? I mean, I guess, you know, I want to be able to tell everyone, but why does it take something earth shattering to move move you in that direction? That's my question. That's it's a it's a good question. Um, I wish I had a good answer. I can say that I think that as a society, we are fascinated by the newest, latest, shiniest thing that is dangled in front of our noses. Um, we're very externally oriented. I think we've lost a sense of connection and soul that is just essential. And we don't wake up to these things until, boy, they're put square in our face. I would say so. And, Do you feel, let me ask you a question, Pat. Do you feel <laughs> it's your responsibility to share your gift with the universe. Cause I feel like that's what you do. And I feel that that's, that's my responsibility as well. It's interesting. I feel like I am where I'm meant to be as a young person. Everybody said I would write and I didn't, I remember writing an economics paper and getting an a minus on it. And I asked the professor why the minus? And he said, you write beautifully, but you have nothing to say. <laughs> well, what do you expect from an economics paper from an 18 year old? I mean, give me a break. <laughs> but I didn't go that route. And, and now some decades later with, particularly with cancer road trip, I'm, I'm writing, I'm podcasting. I'm doing a lot of photography. You know, the film series is in the works. Um, I think that the essence, that the thing that ties it all together is storytelling for me. And I'm where I'm meant to be. I like that. And that's how I feel about BS breast cancer. I feel like I'm where I'm meant to be, doing what I'm meant to be on the daily, greeting people in the morning, letting them know that I too have bad days. I have days I don't get to work out. I have very bad pan, pain days. Like, when I say I'm with a pain doctor, I'm having pain procedures or nerves cut all the time. 
I'm getting an IV. I come home and sometimes it takes me weeks to recover because that's how sore my body is or swollen. These are the things that cancer, the aftermath that cancer has done. I think most people think her cancer's done and she's just milking it. How many times have you felt like this? Somebody said that to you, Pat. I actually had somebody say to me, "You don't. You never had cancer." <laughs> Can you imagine? See, so I feel like you know, people look at us and they just feel like cancer is over. They should be getting on with their lives. So all they do is complain. My life will never be the same, and I have to be near this pain doctor at all times because I went from being in bed all the time to now getting back this almost quality of life. Oh, I like I'm running in the pool. I'll take that. I'm not running on the pavement, but I'm running in the pool. Um, and I'm not giving any of that back. I'm going to stay near the pain doctor. You know, it's our medical system doesn't address any of these post-cancer experiences or issues. And I don't think that they should actually. And let me explain why. I, I think that we have an interventional medical system that works well for some things, but it doesn't work well for your spirit or your soul. And I think that we have to find these answers elsewhere. I would agree. And I, I guess I think that when we are finding these things out afterwards, I wish that the medical community would just say, hey, yeah, you're right. This is a result of your chemo or your cancer or you're not crazy. Many people get sick after cancer. That's where I wish the affirmation would come into play. Did yeah, you know? I, I, I agree. I've been told I was crazy many times and I was not at all. That's, and I was just going to say that many people tell you you're crazy. Now, um, as a matter of fact, when um, I complained of chemo brain, and my chemo brain was so bad that I broke down in Costco crying one day because I could not enter a four-digit pin. That's what I'm telling you, why, why I recommended you know that book, because it has short passages in it. Right after chemo, you're not ready to read a 500-page novel. <laughs> no, but I, I was told the chemo brain was in my head. It's like, yes, it really is in my head. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was not imaginary. <laughs> no, it's a real thing. Forgetting where your car is or just totally being out of it for a moment. That chemo brain, brain is real. If you could rewrite your story, would you? Yes. I'll tell you what I would rewrite. So everybody listening to this, every woman is listening carefully I had time to research my breast reconstructive surgeon. Most cancer patients do. Not all. There's the few cases that you've got to get that out right away. There's a difference between emergent and emergency. Know the difference. Be comfortable with your team and do not move forward. I was not really comfortable with him, but I went on the recommendation of my doctor but then again, he's the doctor that he just didn't take the whole thing serious anyways because of his somewhat chauvinistic attitude towards women to begin with. So that's where I, why I ended up where I did. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing now because that's my calling. So that's what I would change. Take the time to get to recommend, you know, get go to two doctors, go to two different hospitals if you can. Just do it. Take the time and do it right. Make sure. It's so much better to feel sure of yourself and not end up like I did, really unhappy in a bad situation. Generally, for people facing a bump in the road, cancer or not, what what would you suggest to them? What recommendations would you give them? <sighs> Take a moment and breathe. It's all going to be okay. You have all the answers you need within yourself. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. Bump in the Road is a production of Cancer Road Trip. Subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media at Cancer Road Trip, and you can learn more at www.cancerroadtrip.com. Until next time, be safe and be well.